Hello everybody, Mike Portnoy here. It's raining on the streets of New York City, as a uh, song once said. Anyway, the origins of uh, the liquid tension experiment, uh, I suppose, goes back to where my relationship with Magna Carta Records began, and Pete Morticelli and Mike Varney over at the label. And my relationship with them began in 1996, I believe, when they called me to participate in uh, the Rush tribute album that they were doing, Working Man. And uh, that session was the first time that any Dream Theater members had sort of left the family for an outside environment and to do an outside session. But in any case, that session was really great for me because I um, worked with Billy Sheehan. And Billy and I spent uh, almost a week together in San Francisco working out the tracks, playing together, getting to know each other, and, uh, you know, messing with the arrangements of the songs for the uh, tribute album. So in any case, that was a, a great experience and it was a lot of fun to work outside of the, uh, the, the normal confines of Dream Theater, which I had become so accustomed to for 10 years at that point. Uh, after, after working on that project with Billy, uh, the Magna Carta guys came back to me and said, well, how'd you like to do something else? And they offered me the opportunity to put together a project with the players of my choice and basically asked me for a wish list of, of all the different players I'd like to work with. And uh, after months and months of phone calls and um, certain people being available and certain people not being available and aligning different schedules, uh, finally, towards the, uh, the end of 1997, to make a long story short, we found ourselves set up and ready to go with the lineup of myself, uh, the great Tony Levin on bass, who I had always wanted to work with, always admired all of his work 
obviously with Peter Gabriel and uh, King Crimson, but then also the stuff he did with Pink Floyd and Yes and John Lennon and Paul Simon. Obviously, he uh, had the uh, the experience to really play with anybody. Uh, on keyboards, uh, I chose Jordan Rudis, who to me is the most amazing talent to have ever touched a keyboard. Uh, he's just an absolute, total, intense prodigy. He's uh, he was. Uh, admitted to Juilliard at the age of nine, so it gives you an idea of the type of player he is. After um, going through a big list of guitar players and uh, none of them ever quite panning out, my wife actually suggested to me to, uh, to consider using John in this project. And at first I wanted to keep the project completely separate from Dream Theater, but uh, on second thought it really made a lot of sense because John and I have had such a long history together and such a writing chemistry that uh, we figured it would really enhance this outside project and ultimately it really did so I'm really glad that uh, John ended up coming on board. So uh, the project kind of started almost as a solo project of mine but uh, it was obvious the, the minute that we started collaborating that it was going to become a full collaborative band type uh, project and, and that's exactly what happened. And once we hit the studio it, we had one week to create uh, music that was intense, eclectic, instrumental, and, uh, and always exciting. So uh, it was a great experience. Well, here we are in beautiful Millbrook, New York, upstate New York at Millbrook Sound Studios. And this is the place where we made Liquid Tension Experiment 1 and 2. So uh, let me take you inside to take a look at the studio and see where the magic and mayhem all took place. Come on in. As we enter the halls of Millbrook oh, Studios, the video camera makes its unveiling. Wow. These are two of the masterminds behind this project. Good morning. Say <coughs> something are, brilliant, Jordan. Are you uh, unveiling another toy to play bow with? In, in the mail. Um, a a bow. bow. bow in the mail. <coughs> no. Well, you know what? Let's play. Run tape. Don't stop the tape. Let's okay. play such a great thing you're going to jump to the drums. Okay. Jump. I'm not going to be able to hold the camera any longer. Just, just film it. Oh. See if you can resist playing this. Uh, one, two, stop. <laughs> okay. uh. I like it already. The idea behind the music was it was going to be instrumental music. Uh, we were going to try to be very technical, um, try to be very progressive, but at the same time be very melodic. Um, and most importantly, be very spontaneous. Um, there were portions of the recording process that were completely improvised, very jam-oriented things, and then there were uh, you know, several songs that were written, but even those songs were very spontaneous. This is the, the writing process. Normally in a dream theater context, this writing process will last days, weeks, sometimes months. Here we are reduced to mere minutes and hours. So we have to be creative and quick. <laughs> This is the A minor. Yeah. Okay. This is A minor.
The entire project was a lot of fun and uh, I'm going to spend some time now playing through a lot of the tracks from both the first Liquid Tension and the second Liquid Tension albums. And here we go. Let's make our way into the drum room. Well, here we are in the drum room at Millbrook Studios, and this is where all the magic, all of the writing and recording for both Liquid Tension albums uh, were done. And as you can see, uh, I have a much smaller kit here than what I uh, usually play with Dream Theater. And uh, the main reason for that, to be completely honest, is that when the Liquid Tension uh, 1 session was booked, uh, Dream Theater had just finished some shows in Brazil, and my big kit was still being shipped. So I needed to put together an alternate kit to use in the studio. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm really glad that I went with a different kit as opposed to my usual Dream Theater kit because it gave me a whole fresh perspective on uh, creating parts and the writing process. Let me tell you a little bit about this setup. As you can see, it's one bass drum, which was very different for me, and uh, it has a much different feel playing one bass drum then playing two kicks and for 10, 15 years, however long it's been, uh, I've always played with two bass drums. So it was a little bit of a, um, a different approach for me to get used to the feel of double kick on one bass drum. And um, I kind of adapted pretty quickly and, uh, and I was able to do a lot of the things that I usually do with Dream Theater on the two bass drums. And what I, uh, what I did here was I actually, because I had half of the big drum set, I actually was left with only uh, a couple toms. So I added a set of timbalitos uh, and used those as my uh, two high toms. So I actually have uh, a set of timbalitos, a 12 inch rack tom, I believe it's a 14 inch floor tom, and an 18-inch floor tom. And this was also the first time I was able to set up a kit with floor toms on both my left and right. And it, it uh, gave me some pretty cool possibilities with coming up with some of the parts. One thing I had to adjust to uh, when playing a smaller setup with a single bass drum was the way that the drums were angled. And uh, what I did was I, I've pe spent so many years playing a double bass setup where I have the snare in the center and then uh, my two kick drums and then the toms w revolving around it to create some sort of symmetrical setup. It's kind of uh, a little asymmetrical when you're playing with one bass drum because you're kind of angled a certain way. So what I did was I actually set it up as if it was a double bass drum. So with my left pedal, I actually positioned it as if there was another bass drum here to my left, and I put the snare in the center and I based the toms around it as if I was playing a double bass setup, but with only one bass drum. So my main kick is actually angled out. Okay, once I decided on the drum configuration, I had to uh, gather a, a set, of, set of cymbals. And uh, of course, uh, I, I have a wide variety of Sabian cymbals here with me. And uh, even though the drum the drum configuration was scaled down. I, I did use a lot of cymbals as well because uh, I like to have that variety in cymbal land. So uh, as you can see, there's a wide variety and, and there's a bunch of my uh, new custom cymbals on this setup. Uh, these, these exact custom um, creations were used on both Liquid Tension albums. So this setup was there for both of those albums, but since then I have uh, adapted it to the, the symbol line that I'm going to be putting out with Sabian in the year 2000. And it's the Sabian Max line. And that consists of a 7-inch uh, splash, a 9-inch splash, an 11-inch splash. And uh, on this kit, I have two of the three sets of Max Staxes that we're going to have. And here is the low set, which is a 12 China and a 14 Crash, and a 10 China and a 10 Crash. So that's a, a low Stax, and this is a uh, medium Stax. And then uh, in terms of Crashes, I have uh, a 16, a 17, and a 19, and, uh, and one China and one ride, which is my 22-inch uh, HH rock ride, which is used on both kits, the Dream Theater kit and the Liquid Tension kit, and a set of 13-inch hats as opposed to uh, 14s, which I use with Dream Theater, and a bell. <laughs> anyway, that's the uh, setup that we have here, and uh, it was a real nice change of pace for me to be playing on a smaller kit. The first taste I had of, of uh, scaling down was on the Falling Into Infinity album, 
uh, when I actually had two drum sets set up in the studio. And uh, we did that album a few months uh, before the Liquid Tension 1 session. And I enjoyed myself so much on the small kit that it was really nice to be able to play uh, some real progressive parts on a kit of this size. And, and I'm really glad that I did it because it, it, it was... It gave me a whole fresh perspective as opposed to just playing, you know, on the usual dream theater environment. Uh, so I was able to apply myself kind of differently. Well, this is where it all began. In this room, behind this kit, this is where we first gathered and uh, began the liquid tension experiment in the fall of 97. And uh, we knew we wanted to come right out of the bag with something that was going to slap you in the face <laughs> and tell you that we weren't messing around. So uh, the very first thing we wrote was Paradigm Shift. And uh, it's the very first thing you hear in the album. And uh, I guess it was everybody's very first taste of the liquid tension experiment. So uh, I'm going to play a bit of that for you now. And, um, and then I'll come back and break some of it down for you. Okay, the most immediate thing that jumps out and grabs you right by the throat is that opening bit. And uh, not to pat myself on the back, but <laughs> that was something that uh, I had, and, and it was revolved around a, a drum pattern. And basically, when we got together to write the song, uh, you know, we had the idea of coming out full guns blazing. So uh, and there was no better way than just to have this completely sick unison thing. So I had this pattern. Uh, probably just came up with it on the spot, I'm sure. And then uh, those guys, as, as incredible as they are, just completely doubled it, uh, you know, w with ease. So let me uh, break down that pattern for you right now. Okay, the pattern, um, like so many of these patterns that I play, uh, is, is broken up between the snare and the kick drums. And uh, I'll cut this into two pieces. The first piece... Uh, is a pattern that happens three times. And it's one, two, one, two, six, and two. So that's two on the snare, two on the kicks, six on the snare, two on the kicks. Let me play that for you. Three, four. You 
You put them together, and they sound like this. Okay, now the second half of this is um, a pattern of six on the snare, two on the kick drum, then six on the first timbali, six on the second timbali, and then four on the snare. So let me play that now for you. Now, let me put the two together. So uh, we're going to have the first half and the second half put together, and there you have the opening to Paradigm Shift. I'll play at normal speed, and then I'll slow it down, then bring it back up to speed. One, two, three, four. Awesome. Uh, what I'd like to do is, before I get too into all of the parts I'm going to break down, I would like to just open up my uh, toolbox or my bag of tricks and um, give you a, a, a brief um, layout of, of the sort of fills that I like to use a lot. And you'll notice them throughout all of my records, all the songs I play. Whenever I'm looking for a fill, a lot of them are developed around these patterns which I have, which are patterns between the hands and the feet in groups of twos, fours, and sixes, sometimes even eights. Um, and basically they sound like this. <laughs> now if I was to slow that, when, it, when you play them up to speed, it sounds like Fred Flintstone starting his car. Uh, after a binge at the, uh, at the bowling alley. But anyway, uh, when you slow them down, what they are are actual just patterns of twos, fours, sixes, and, um, and you could break them up any way you'd like. Um, the easiest way to start to get comfortable with them is to do them just on the snare and the kick drums. So, for instance, a two and two pattern would sound like this. A four and two pattern would sound like. A six and two pattern would sound like. So anyway, um, these are three variations amongst many which I utilize all the time. So throughout this video, you'll see, see me talking about them, breaking them down. But I just wanted you to uh, become aware of them because it is a big part of my style and a big part of my fills. And uh, once I started developing some of these type of ideas on the drums, uh, I would just come up with different uh, patterns. I would do a two and a two and a four and a two, or a four and a two and a six and a two, and then I would maybe break up the snare and the tom. You know, if I was doing a four and a two rather than just doing four on the snare, I would go uh, maybe snare tom, snare tom, kick, kick. 
you know, breaking them up around the toms. You could do all sorts of different combinations, and it's a matter of just experimenting and getting comfortable with the patterns. So anyway, uh, this is a, a big part of my toolbox and my bag of tricks that you should be made aware of before we get any further into some of these riffs and, and uh, parts. One of my favorite moments on the second liquid tension album is uh, the 17 minute extravaganza when the water breaks. And uh, working in the, in the um, format of a very long song to me is always the most rewarding uh, because you could throw in so many different ideas and styles and, and uh, kind of just go for it and throw everything but the kitchen sink in. And this song was uh, definitely one of those types of songs. And um, I'm going to actually play through uh, a portion of that song right now. Uh, um, and the portion that I'm going to play through right now begins with uh, a bit of a drum solo. And um, like I've said, what I played on the album, so much of it was spontaneously created that uh, it, it's hard for me to go back and remember exactly what I did because so much of it was on the spot. So uh, the drum solos in this particular sec section of When the Water Breaks were completely improvised. So I don't think I'd be able to ever reproduce them properly right now. So what I'm going to do is actually um, just go for it again and improvise again. And what we did when creating this part was uh, Tony Lovin just laid down a, a solid uh, ostinato pattern on the bass, and it was in six. One, two, three, four, five, six, or you can count it in threes. One, two, three, one, two, three. In any case, he laid that down uh, a solid foundation, and I just went completely out and went berserk on top of it. So I'm going to uh, start off with that piece, with the uh, improv drum solos, and then it's going to move further into the song for a few minutes so you can get a, uh, a taste of what was going on in that piece.
Okay, after uh, the the big, big build with the improvised drum solos, uh, I kick into a groove, which is actually broken up into 7-8 and 5-8. The rest of the band is continuing with the ostinato that Tony Levin laid down underneath the solos, which was in 6. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So after playing solos over six, when I finally joined back up with the band, rather than joining in in a six pattern, I tried to make it interesting and played a, a different subdivision from the rest of the band. So while they continued in six four, I um, broke the pattern up into eighth notes. So six four or six quarter notes would be equivalent to 12 eighth notes. So what I did was came up with a way to play a subdivision with eighth notes uh, equaling 12 eighth notes to equal their six quarter notes. <laughs> anyway, so what I did was this pattern was 7, 8, and 5, 8. And if you add up the 7 and the 5, that gives you 12. And there are your 12 eighth notes. So that would be counted 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Another thing I like to do is I like to take um, a particular groove and then um, rather than continuing to play it one way, I'll start to phrase it differently around the drums or maybe use different instruments to bring the groove out. So that groove in 7-8 and 5-8, after I played it eight times through or whatever it was, then I actually um, switched the groove up a little bit and started to use different cymbals to play those accents. So I played the same pattern, but then I went to more of an open hi-hat using um, the, uh, the medium stack right here to play the same pattern in 7, 8, and 5, 8. So let me play that for you now. Okay, the last uh, thing that I would like to break down from this excerpt of When the Water Breaks is the drum fill that closes out the section. And once again, uh, this is taken from my traditional bag of tricks, and it utilizes um, a pattern similar to the one I broke down earlier, um, based around patterns uh, with the hands and the feet, snare, kick drum, and the toms, and so on. So I'm gonna break this down for you. What happened was, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, I believe either Jordan or John were playing this thing on top. This whole pattern on top uh, while we were grooving. Uh, we, we were playing a, a thing in seven, and they uh, had this strange syncopated pattern on top uh, while we were in seven. And then we uh, decided to end the section with me actually joining in with the pattern and then closing it out. So let me break that pattern down for you. What's, what's going on there, instead of playing the pattern like I did earlier, um, solely on the snare and the kick drums, I'm actually breaking the top part up between my snare and left floor tom. So rather than just doing two hits on the snare, I'm going right left between the snare and the left floor tom. So the pattern uh, that, that is starting here, it's four sets of two and two, and then two and four. And the twos on top are always right, left, meaning snare and floor tom. And then two with the kicks, right, left on top again, and then four with the kicks. So let me play that for you. And this happens four times. One, two, three. So that's the first half of the pattern, and it does that four times, two and two, two and four. Then the, uh, the ending of the fill is um, four on the snare, two with the kick, 
four on the right floor tom, two with the kick, two toms, two snares, cymbal choke. So, once again, four on the snare, two with the kick, four on the floor tom, two with the kick, two toms, two snares, cymbal choke. So let me play that for you now. Now, I'll put the two phrases together. So we'll start with the first phrase, and it'll be directly connected to the second phrase. And I'll start with the whole pattern at normal speed, and then I'll slow it down and bring it back up.
our vocal piece, you know, we gotta establish Wednesday. some sort of hook, we need a radio tune. <laughs> One of the most exciting aspects for me about the liquid tension experiment was the opportunity to work with the great legendary Tony Levin on bass and stick. And uh, one of the best memories I have of the first album's session was the duet that he and I did. And we ended up calling it Chris and Kevin's Excellent Adventure <laughs> for reasons which I won't go into here. But uh, in any case, it was a, an opportunity for both of us to completely stretch out and improvise Anyway, so one morning I was fiddling around on the drums, just warming up, and I stumbled upon this uh, pretty cool shuffle groove. And uh, before I had the chance to forget it, I started screaming and yelling into the control room for somebody to roll that. And uh, luckily, I, I record every session I do. And this was one of those moments where I stumbled into this groove. If I hadn't laid it down on tape, I probably would have forgotten it. It would have never gotten used. Then when uh, the idea came for me and Tony to do a duet, uh, we ended up using this shuffle as the foundation for this little improv thing that he and I did. But anyway, I'd like to break down the Chris and Kevin shuffle groove for you so you could see exactly what I'm doing. Uh, the most important element of this groove is the ghost notes. And ghost notes are something that, uh, that I think are a real important part of playing. Um, for those of you that don't know what a ghost note is, it's when you're actually playing on the snare, but you're not playing a full impact hit. You're actually just sort of uh, tapping lightly in between the twos and the fours or whatever the big hits are. And uh, that's the biggest part of this Chris and Kevin groove. So let me play it for you at normal tempo, and then I'll slow it down, and you could sort of uh, see what it is that I'm doing here. Now slower.
la 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 yeah baby yeah Okay, right now I'm going to play through um, a f couple of sections from uh, a track off the second Liquid Tension album called Another Dimension. And uh, both of these sections are taken from the middle of the song when we were able to uh, play around with some odd time signatures. So um, here we go. Okay, um, there's a lot going on there, and uh, it's almost all completely dealing with odd time signatures, which is, uh, to me, the most fascinating part of playing drums. So much of my style is revolved around odd time signatures and numbers and counting and arithmetic and so on. And uh, this is a perfect example of, of that style of playing. Uh, what's going on at the beginning of this section is I'm playing... Um, what I call a jungle groove between the toms and the snare and the patterns are uh, alternating back and forth between four and five and then every fourth bar the five is actually becoming a six so it's it's being counted as four and five four and five four and five four and six let me play the pattern for you and I'll count it along so you can uh, understand how to count it one two three four
So you can see there at the end, all I did was instead of going a blah blah bam on the five, I, <laughs> a triplet on the five, I went uh, two triplets to set up five and six. Five triplet, six triplet, bam. Uh, then, after a uh, full round of jungle grooves going four, five, four, five, four, five, four, six, I then uh, translate that groove or that metric modulation uh, to more of a ride groove. And uh, I'm also doing some, I, I th think it would be 30-second note uh, accents along with the guitar. Um, so let me play that for you now uh, in the context of the ride pattern. One, two, three. Like I mentioned, there's a, uh, a fast 30-second note thing happening with the guitar. Uh, just then, for the sake of um, breaking down the example, I didn't include it, but now I will include it and play it for you. So let me slow that down. One, two, one, two. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to break down the second piece that, uh, that I played from another dimension. Uh, this is very similar to the first piece that I played because it's dealing with a lot of odd time signatures. And what I did was I developed my part uh, the same exact way melodically. Uh, what's happening is it's starting with a pattern on the toms, a jungle groove thing, and then it's developing to a ride sort of pattern, and it's uh, very similar in that sense to the previous section, except now this time, instead of counting in fours and fives and everything, this is actually dealing with sevens and fours and sixes. So let me count this out for you. Uh, the beginning pattern for this section is actually seven, four, and four, and the seven can be counted as four and three, then four and four. Uh, so you can count it one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's the first set. So let me play that for you first. Two, three. to count that it would be one two three four one two three one two three four one two three four two three four one two three one two three four one two three Now, once you get that first step done, there's actually a second step to that whole process because what's happening is it's the second part of it is going seven, four, and six. And all that means is there's an extra two eighth notes at the end. So as before, we were going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now we're going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, meaning the four and the two equaling six. So it's seven, four, and six. Basically, it's the exact same pattern, except I'm adding an extra two beats at the end. So let me play that for you now. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, 
Now, if you put them together uh, without any of the repeats, what you're going to have is seven, four, four, seven, four, six. So now let me play the, the entire back to back uh, groove for you. One, two, three. Now, once again, like the previous section, what I did was I took that same time signature pattern and then developed it onto a ride groove. So what's happening now is you're having the same thing, seven, four, four, seven, four, six, but now it's being played in a more groove type um, fashion. So here we go. I'm going to play that now for you with the ride pattern. One, two.
Okay, now I'm going to play for you um, a chunk from Universal Mind, which was uh, from the first Liquid Tension album. And uh, I would like to just start off, before I get into the entire piece, I would like to start off showing the pattern that I'm playing to begin this section. And this follows um, an, uh, a piano solo by Jordan Rudis. And then myself and Tony Levin come in with this pattern, which is um, in 7, 8, 7, and 7. And it's, that's the way it's phrased the whole way through. So it almost feels like it's in 7 the whole time, except for the second bar, we're slipping in an extra eighth note. So uh, let me break that down now for you slowly. Slow it down for you now. One, two, three, four. The way that would be counted is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, now after playing that pattern through with Tony uh, four times, then I did my usual uh, development, uh, which means, you know, take the pattern and take it to the next stage musically. Um, sometimes I do that in terms of numbers and breaking up the time signatures differently, or sometimes I just do that in terms of the instrumentation or orchestration uh, with the drums and cymbals. In this case, it was the orchestration. So what I did was I took that pattern and then developed it uh, more to a China sort of thing, uh, very similar to what I did earlier in When the Water Breaks. So let me play that now for you in the, uh, in the developed stage. One, two, three, four. So now, now that you know the intro and understand, hopefully, uh, how I started this bit off, uh, now you can actually see it in the context of the music, and uh, we'll take it from this point and take it up straight to the end. So here we go, Universal Mind. <laughs>
Well, the future of LTE. It's kind of uh, hard to say where uh, the band will go from this point because Liquid Tension originally started as the opportunity for myself and John to have uh, an outside environment from Dream Theater. And as you know, um, uh, Jordan Rudis, as a result of the two Liquid Tension albums, has since joined Dream Theater full time. So, uh, you know, three quarters of Liquid Tension is now three fifths of Dream Theater. So I really don't see uh, the purpose of, of making any future studio albums with Liquid Tension because uh, we already have this writing chemistry that we assembled now working full time in Dream Theater. However, um, we will always be open and uh, excited about the idea of ever doing live shows. So there are always possibilities of live shows with Liquid Tension in the future. So that would never be counted out. In the meantime, because I no longer have this uh, outside writing environment with Liquid Tension, I've assembled yet another <laughs> uh, side project. And, and this is one that uh, I worked on this past summer of 99. It'll be coming out in the uh, winter of uh, 2000. Wow, that's wild. But in any case, this is more of a, uh, a prog rock type uh, super group. And basically, I assembled some musicians from other uh, newer progressive bands, uh, musicians who I really admire, uh, even more for their writing talents, uh, more than their playing technical abilities. But in any case, this project uh, uh, has Pete Chuavis on bass, who is the bass player from Marillion, one of the most melodic bass players I've ever heard. Uh, Neil Morse, um, who is the main writing force and singer and keyboard player for Spock's Beard. And um, Royna Stolt, who is the guitar player and vocalist and main writing force behind the Swedish band The Flower Kings. And uh, the four of us assembled once again at Millbrook for uh, a 10 day period and, and created an album very much uh, like Liquid Tension in terms of the way it was created. But uh, musically, it's very, very different. It's very, very long songs. Uh, we have a 30-minute composition on there, and it's very much in the old-school uh, vein of Yes and Pink Floyd and the Beatles. All four of us are singing. And it gave me a chance to really lay back and do my best Ringo or John Bonham impersonation, which was fun for a change. So that's Liquid Tension's future. That's the future of uh, my uh, latest side project as well. And uh, as far as the future for Dream Theater, uh, as you know, we, we have a, a brand new album out, Metropolis 2, Scenes from a Memory. And in case you don't know, see the second video as part of this set, which will focus on all of Dream Theater's music uh, for our latest album, and it will give you a glimpse of where we are going in the future. So I hope to see you in that video. Thanks for checking this one out, and see you soon.